All right. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Brian Taylor with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, and thank you so much for joining us um, for session number three of our uh, 2023 Water Watch Lecture Series. We're really excited for tonight's uh, program and presentation, and I know a lot of folks are as well out there. So we've had um, I, just a shout out to all of you who have been joining us. We've got record turnouts for the past um, several uh, programs, and um, in fact, we have <laughs> about a little over 460 registrations for this lecture. So we really appreciate all of you um, joining and, and supporting and learning uh, with us with a, a really great diverse mix of, uh, of presenters uh, and topics. So um, so thanks very much for joining. Um, if you're not familiar with the, the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, we're just a local grassroots nonprofit whose sole mission is to preserve and protect one of our most natural resources. Of course, that uh, being water, if again, if we were here in person, I'd ask, raise your hand if you've ever used water before. So uh, pretty important. And we're all about preserving and protecting that both for people, uh, for nature and the animals and uh, and all that. I see some people raising their hands in the, in the chat. So, um, well, so uh, thanks so much for joining. A brief shout out to our sponsors. Um, uh, this program is being sponsored by Clean Harbors, Clearwater Recovery, and the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Duxbury. Hanover, Marshfield, Norwell, Pembroke, Plymouth, and Situate. So thanks again for our sponsors who year after year uh, help us promote uh, and, and continue programs, educational programs just like this. So um, thanks again. And thanks all of you. We've got uh, oh, close to 130 people here uh, tuned in right now. So thanks all of you for being here. So before we begin, I'd like to send that over to uh, my counterpart with Mass Audubon, Doug Lowry. So Doug Lowry, if you want to say a few things. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, everybody, for joining us on our third installment of this year's Water Watch series. What a testament the numbers are. So as Brian alluded to this, yeah, 128 participants, 129 participants so far uh, tuned in this evening. That's incredible. Uh, and we are so grateful uh, for you to be supporting uh, both of our organizations by being present tonight. Uh, just, I, I always like to spend just a minute or two uh, singing the praises of our uh, kindred spirit, the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. It's just a, an amazing grassroots organization that really is a mover and shaker, uh, both locally, but also well beyond the watershed uh, limits. So thanks for your support. And over here at Mass Audubon, we are uh, doing our best to, to meet the goals of our action agenda, uh, uh, which is something we've devoted to about a year and a half ago. And we welcome you to look at our website and, and find the action agenda. Uh, we hope you're impressed. Locally, we have a couple of programs coming up next week. Uh, I'd like to talk about. One is our every first Thursday of the month, Sally Avery, one of South Shore's most beloved birders, uh, does her program called Birding as a Pathway to Phenology at Daniel Webster Wildlife Sanctuary. We'd love to have you join us for that some sometime. And you can do that by registering uh, at massaudubon.org forward slash South Shore, and we start around 8.30. And then we welcome everybody on the first Friday of the month to our North River office, which is 2000 Main Street or Route 3A in Marshfield, overlooking the North River. And that is an open uh, house, essentially, every first Friday of the month from 9 to 10, Come enjoy. It's free. You don't have to register. Come and join us. There's coffee and usually something pastry-like, and it's an opportunity to, to get together and talk about what's happening uh, natural history-wise, both in your neighborhood and around town. So thanks again for joining us, and back to you, Brian. Great. Thanks, Doug. 
if uh, if it's the scones that are going to be available there, which I know, Doug, Larry, you make great scones. I will say that. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce someone very special within the community. Um, this is we are here joined with Dr. Fisher. Um, Chief Fisher is the presiding chief counsel uh, Sachem for the Mattakisa tribe of the Massachusetts Indian Nation and Ambassador Delegate to the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues on behalf of the Mattakesit Tribe. Chief Fisher has 15 years of experience in intergovernmental tribal relations and serves as an expert on Indigenous issues at the UN and abroad. Prior to his role as observer to the UN, he served as the founding council chief Sachem for the Mattakesit Tribal Government. Outside of the many duties, uh, Chief Fisher is an adjunct professor at the KCNH, the Kingdom College of Natural Health, and in the School of Functional Medicine. He is a licensed existential holistic practitioner, addiction recovery coach, and substance abuse counselor as well. His passions include assisting individuals who suffer from addiction issues and from long-term or acute biological dysregulation, generation, and historical and insidious traumas. So without further ado, Dr. Fisher, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you. The audience is yours. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Doug uh, Katabatush, to the both of you and to your organizations for having me um, this evening. Uh, it's always a very exciting and honorable thing to do to uh, to ask the local folks in the area, the indigenous peoples, to come and give a little history and background of who they are, where they come from, and kind of what they're up to, and kind of to say hello. We still exist in the area. So thank you again for extending this invitation, Brian. Um, I wanted to just open up, uh, before I speak, uh, I'd like to open up with just a, a song that was given to me on the on the road, you know, on the journey of, of being Native. Um, we go to powwows and, you know, we, uh, we engage in different ceremonies and so on and so forth. So I want to just share this song with you all. <clears throat> Wakan, wada, wakan, wakan, da, da, we know, hello, hey, 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 pa, oh, day, game, nay, hey, no, we know, we not, ya, we know, hello, hey, 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 oh, hey, we know, we know, we know, we not, ya, we know, hello, hey, 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 oh, hey. Waka, wada, waka, waka, da, da, we know, hello, hey, 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 Walk on, walk on, walk on, walk on, down, now we know, hello, way, hey, 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 pa, oh, day, gay, hey, hey, no, we know, we not, yeah, we know, hello, way, hey, 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 oh, hey, we know, we know, we know, we not, yeah, we know, hello, hey, 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 oh, hey. Walk on, walk on, walk on, walk on, down, now we know, hello, way, hey, hey, pa, oh, day, gay, hey, hey, no, we know, we not, yeah, we know, hello, way, hey, 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 oh, hey, we know, we know, we know, we not, yeah, we know, hey, oh, hey, 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 oh, hey. That song was a song that was given to me, was taught to me uh, by a dear friend of mine's. And that song means to thank God. So I thank God for this moment. I thank God for all of you who decided uh, on this evening to be here in this ceremony. Um, I know that it's a virtual time to share, but we'll make the best of what we have. 
So thank you again, uh, everyone, for being here tonight. Thank you. Here uh, you will see where our villages were and still are um, in so many ways. So as you can see there, you'll see Titicate um, by the areas that became Plymouth Colony. So before they were called Plymouth Colony, these areas had tribal names. You can see Manamet, you can see Agawam, um, you see Titicate, you can see a Sonic Neck, um, there's a Cushionet. So there's a ton, ton of different names. So then up top here, you can see Mattachesit, but in parentheses written as Massachusetts. You can also see Namaskit. So these were the primary areas in the southeastern Massachusetts region that the Mattachesit people, we, uh, you know, we lived there. You know, that was kind of like home base for us. Although we kind of roamed around different areas within the southeastern Mass, uh, one of our main villages was called Titicate. It was our home village. Um, and so here you see uh, Dr. Jeremy Bangs, who wrote the Indian Deeds book. Um, he was able to look at the old deeds that were uh, archived, and he interpreted them into um, into a book. And he calls this book the Indian Deeds book. It was it was a very well put together piece of uh, documentation that was actually very supportive and helpful to the continued effort of uh, sustainability for the Mattachesett people. So we thank Dr. Bangs and his continued efforts um, to support the Mattachesett tribe. Uh, next slide, please. So where our villages are, you can see the Mattachesett people, our community was a, is just one community located within the Pembroke, Bridgewater, Noel, that southeastern Massachusetts area that actually was one village that fell underneath what was called the Massachusetts Nation, where most of us know or some may not know that the Commonwealth state of Massachusetts today bears its name from the great nation of the Massachusetts people. And so here you can kind of see Sharon, you got Massapog. Maybe some of you all have been to Massapog Pond in that area. Canton, what is now known as the Blue Hills, um, we still call that village and that home place for us. It's called the Ponkapog Village. Um, Wellesley and Natick, uh, Cochituate, Newton, Mass, Nonantum, Medford, Mystic, uh, Linfield, um, Quantipoet, it's uh, Wamasset. You have, you know, you have all these different ones in the hunt, which some of you all know is right across the water there from Revere. Um, and then you have Mattachesett down here for Pembroke, Patuxet, uh, Plymouth, Mattapoisett. So these are just some of the traditional indigenous names of the places that some of you all who are joining us tonight probably actually live in some of these places. So you may or may not know. I always say, look, go to your local historical society and ask who are the indigenous peoples? What was their information? You know, how did they live? What was their lifestyle like? You know, get to know your, uh, who's in, well, which backyard you're in. So uh, you can go to the next slide, Brian. Thank you. So the Mattachusett people today, we have a reservation called the Titicate Reserve. It was a very interesting reservation. It's considered a perpetual restrictive covenant. And we'll get into that a little later. I'll talk about how the Sachem was able to strategically, during the early times of the 1600s, be able to create and get the Plymouth Colony Court to recognize um, and support his ability uh, to be able to sustain this land and to create a reserve out of it that was recognized by the Plymouth Colony Court. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in some of these slides. Um, Brian, you can go to uh, to the next one. Um, right here is by the time 1670 hit, you can see that these were actually some of the names of some of the dominant sachems that were in the territory. And, and, and so for you all who don't know what a sachem is, we say sachem more in the English Anglo um, vocabulary or vernacular. However, it was Sakam in our language, in the Algonquin language of the Massachusetts people. 
So a sad a sakum or a sachem is a person who served as a leader, a tribal leader, or what is known today as a chief for a community. And so today that's the position that uh that I was divinely appointed to um, by our clan mothers and also by by God, you know, by our creator Kantantuit. Um, and so I serve in that capacity. So you can see a few. The ones that I highlighted here, Josiah Wampatuck, these are people who I actually descend from. Uh, Kutcher Macon was his uncle who raised him when his father, Chickatabit, died. Um, Chickatabit, Josiah Wampatuck, Chickatabit. So you can see all of those. You can go to the next one, Brian. Um, this next slide is just a little information and background about when Boston became incorporated. Why is it so important that Boston became incorporated? Well, a lot of people don't know that um, it is said that the city of Boston uh, was given to the Boston proprietors uh, in 1630 by Chickataw, who was one of the grand sachems of the Massachusetts Indian Nation. Um, I will tell you this for the record, that it is very much so up for debate whether or not that was a theft or whether that was a rightful ownership or, but when we get into some of the deeds and the language of the deeds a little later in this lecture, you can kind of make an educational observation on your own, whether you believe some of these lands were actually given or were they taken. And by the actual deed and the language of the deed, you'll be able to make another educational observation that shows, could it be possible based off of the lawful language within the deed for someone outside of Indian ownership to actually estrange Indian lands to someone who is non-Indian? So you'll be able to make that educational observation on your own as well. And so one of the things is I don't like to throw things on people. I like for people, I like to give you enough information for you to critically think about what's actually happening or what actually took place. So here it says that Boston was incorporated in 1630 by English Puritans fleeing religious persecution. Boston was traditionally known as the Great Shamut Village. I don't know if you all have been in Roxbury. There's a street called Shamut Ave. Um, it's named after the people who were there. Those were the Shamut people. That was another village within the Massachusetts nation. Um, and it was governed by, at that time, it was governed by the sachem who went by the name of Nani Pashmit. Okay, Brian, you can go to the next one. Chief Sachem Chikatabit, he was the sachem during the time. He died in 1633. He was a great sachem of the Massachusetts Indian Nation. 1630, it was said that Chikatabit deeded the land, like I said before, to what is now called the city of Boston. To the Puritans in 1621, Chickataba ruled lands from the Merrimack to the north, to the Charles to the west, and also to the lands of the Nahaganawak people uh, right in right on the Rhode Island boundary, which were the neighbors of the Massachusetts, the Mattachese, and Poconoke people. Uh, Brian, thank you. You can go to the, to the next slide. So I call this slide Sachem's Grand Entry. Chief Sachem Chickatabit was, uh, he, he died in 1633 of what most of you all know as smallpox or uh, what is it, leprosporosis, um, and was succeeded as Sachem by his brother. Uh, his name was Cut Um, And that was due to his son Wampatuck being way too young to succeed him uh, in the village and on the throne, if you will. So uh, next slide, please. So Wampatuck, he was born in 1627. He died in 1669. He was a sachem of the Mattachusa tribe, uh, the Massachusetts Indians of Greater Boston and New England. His name means white deer, a tuck in our language. It means deer. Uh, the way that we say white is womp or wampi. Um, he was a son of the great sachem uh, Chickatabit and nephew of his successor, Sagamore Kutchamakin, before succeeding himself as Sagamore around 1660. So this gentleman who they've... Now, I will say this. As far as accuracy goes in the depiction of 
this picture being Wampatuck, it's actually used in Rhode Island in some of their historical societies as a depiction of Ninigrit, who is one of the great sachems of the Nahaganawak and the Niantic people. So we don't know whether or not this depiction is actually Wampatuck, which is labeled as Wampatuck in so many archives in Massachusetts, but it's also labeled in so many archives in Rhode Island. And why is that? Right? Why is that? There could be tons of theories. Maybe at the time the English didn't care and they were like, look, hey, if you catch him, call him Ninigrit because we want him. If you catch him, call him Wampatuck because we want him. We want all the leaders, right? We got to get rid of these guys. We need some land to to uh to get. So um next one. Thank you. What does Mattachisit mean? So Pembroke, when it was incorporated, before it was incorporated, actually, it was known as an area called Namasakisit by the Massachusetts Indians, which means place of much fish. Because of the annual springtime run of herring in the local rivers, and also known as Mattachisit, the great planting fields, because of the agricultural practices that the Mattachisit people were amazing at back in the day there. So um, most of you who live in the area, you may have gone into Plymouth or, you know, certain areas, and you notice that there's heron runs. There's tons of heron runs. And those heron, they still run to this day. And so that's a great practice that we still do. Um, I think a year ago or two, we brought our tribal youth down to the heron run, and they and they were able to to get some heron, and we did ceremony with the heron, and we feasted, you know, as our ancestors once did. It was a nice thing to do. Um, Brian, you can go to the next slide, please. So Wampatuck, a wise Indian. Chief Wampatuck made several restrictive covenants over Indian land, which are now called land deeds, known as restrictive conveyances, and were drafted before his death in 1669 and were recognized and acknowledged by the Plymouth Colony Court. These agreements were between the settlers himself and his heirs reserved in perpetuity for a trusted conveyance to an English to be seen as legitimate in the eyes of the Indian. It had to be approved by the Grand Sachem and nobody else. So the reason why I thought that this was extremely important was because in our tribe today, we still look at the original deeds from the early 1600s. And in those deeds, Wampatuck at the time, who was in, he spoke primarily Algonquin, but was able to write in a legal manner um, to reserve the lands in perpetuity. It was the language that he chose why we put out there that Wampatuck was was such a wise Indian man or native man or indigenous man was because he worked so hard to reserve these lands that today we as a tribe still reserve our rights to uh, our sovereignty on our tribal lands in a perpetuity manner based off of a deed that he drafted back in the 1600s. What an amazing uh, and intelligent um, chief he was. So uh, thank you, Brian. You can go to the next slide. Wampatuck's Grand Entry. After the Mohawk attacked the Massachusetts Indians back in 1665, the Mattachese Sachem Wampatuck led a retaliatory raid on the Mohawk village of Kahnawake in 1669. Unfortunately, Wampatuck returned no more to, uh, to Mattachese villages. Um, where he was ambushed on the return of his journey coming back. Um, this one here has stuck with me for a very long time, obviously, as one of the successors um, in my role as Sachem. And so a few years back, uh, we met with the Mohawk, um, with the Mohawk brothers uh, in at the United Nations and we shook hands and we broke bread, you know, and we shared this, these stories. There was a lot of pain. There was a lot of hurt um, that's been carried on uh, from the attack of, of our great Sachem. 
and so it was a time for us all to heal. And so we, uh, we worked to do that. Um, next slide, please. King Philip's War, most of you probably have heard of it, 1675, known as the First Indian War, which was an armed conflict in 1675 to 1678 between the Indians of the Poconoke Nation and the New England colonists and their Indian allies. The war is named for one of our great leaders, Pometacomet, the Poconoke chief who adopted the name Philip, or really who was given the name by the English, Philip. The war continued in the most northern reaches of New England until the signing of the Treaty of Casco Bay in April of 1678. And that's what created what's called the Casco Bay Treaty, which most New England tribes in this area are actually underneath and protected by the Casco Bay Treaty, which is another jurisdictional support that helps to support land jurisdiction and sovereign rights of New England Indians through the Casco Bay Treaty in 1678. Um, I would encourage you all, if you're interested, go check it out. Do a little research. You know, maybe your research can help some of the local tribes in your area to uh, to be um, better supported around their, their sovereignty rights. You may find something that they didn't find. Help them out. Do what you can. Next slide, please, Brian. So where were the Mattakesa people during the King Philip's War? Well, I'll tell you. That's actually a picture of me and my cousin James. We took a boat from the Mattakesett Wharf in Duxbury, which I don't know if any of you all know, but some of you all who fish or have homes in Duxbury, you may know where the Mattakesett Wharf is. It's named after our tribe. But there's an island that during the time the King Philip's War broke out, they moved the Mattakesett people to this island, and this island was called the Clark's Island, which is now in the Duxbury Bay, where an estimated half of possibly 500 or more Mattakesett are certain to have perished and were killed on that desolate island. Governor Winslow, he led Plymouth Colony's Council of War in ordering the forced removal of all Mattakesett men, women, and children to incarceration on cold, unsheltered, and desolate Clark's Island. So when we went to Clark's Island, it was um, it was quite the experience to stand where you know that your your family was was killed and was starved and so on and so forth. So when we go and visit Clark's Island, in a way, in a spiritual way, it's it's like a pilgrimage um, for us, you know, as Indian people of Mattakesett to visit Clark's Island and to be able to stand where our children, um, and our women and our families, our men, they were starved out and they were killed um, when Governor Winslow uh, ordered them to Clark's Island. So they would not fight and be involved in the, uh, the King Philip's War. So next slide, please. Major's Purchase. Uh, you may have heard of this if you live in Pembroke, or if you know about anything in Pembroke, uh, Major's Purchase took place in 1662. Hanson was incorporated February 22nd in 1820 and was formerly the West Parish of the town of Pembroke, being of 9,730 acres. Nearly all of its territory is embraced in the purchase of Major Josiah Winslow of Chief Wampatuck as by deed dated July 9th, 1662, known as the Major's Purchase. Today, there is a reserve. Back then, there was a reserve that was um, made um, in, in said deed of a 1,000 acres about the ponds at Pembroke, lying in Pembroke and Hanson to his son in George Wampy, which is still supposed to belong to the heirs, which are known today as us, the Mattakesa tribe and the people of the Mattakesa tribe. Um, it's a deed. Uh, the deed was never abrogated by law, by federal law, or by the, um, the federal, you know, the federal government. They've never abrogated that deed. Um, and because the deed was done with the Plymouth Colony Court, the Plymouth Colony Court was underneath the authority of the, um, the King of England. It actually makes all deeds that were done before the incorporation of the United States of America it considers them to be treaty-based um, land land deeds 
in agreement. So they're treaties. They're more than deeds, they're treaties. And a treaty can only be abrogated by way of, um, of Congress. And so Congress has never abrogated any of the Mattachese deeds. So therefore, although some folks view themselves living in a town called Pembroke or living in a town called Hanson, if we were to bring these deeds in front of a federal judge, a federal judge would have to follow federal law, which would then show that these deeds are, they were never abrogated, so they're still valid. And that's what is so interesting about the Mattachese tribe. We have several deeds like this one here that you see um, and that we're speaking about that are actually live and well still. And some of you may or may not know, but a couple of years ago, uh, Justice Gorsuch, who was a U.S. Supreme Court justice, he actually ruled that um, Indians cannot have their land taken anymore by being strong armed. Um, they have to follow the law. And so in the Gorsuch case, it was actually Gorsuch, Judge Justice Gorsuch, who told the Supreme Court and the U.S. federal government and the state of Oklahoma that they had to give back half of the state of Oklahoma to the Muscogee Creek tribe. Um, that was an unbelievable precedent set case that took place. Um, of course, you know, we have to respect law in, in all aspects. And so the law still states that uh, these deeds are active. Thousand Acres still do belong to the Mattachese tribe. The deed has not been abrogated. So um, that's the way we view things as Mattachese people. Uh, we view things under the law and we view things underneath tribal law, federal law and tribal law. So please, uh, Brian, next slide. Here is a, I, I put this map up so you can kind of see that all of this, the town of Hanson and the town of Pembroke, all if you put those two together, and then you have Odom's Pond and all the ponds, Fernham Pond, and what they what they call Indian Head Pond, so appropriate. Um, yeah, so all these ponds are within the vicinity of Mattachusett territory. So these two towns that you see in the map, you put those together, that was also all considered Mattachusett. And if you wanted to separate the boundaries, you could look at it and say, okay, well, 1,000 acres that was reserved for George Wampy, 500 of those acres could come off the boundary lines of Hanson, and another 500 could come off the boundary line of Pembroke. So neither one of those towns are squirming. No, I'm just joking. But seriously, that's the honest to God's truth there. So, Brian, thank you. Next slide. Town of Pembroke, incorporated in 1712. Pembroke has a long and rich history as we know it in, 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 in a beautiful uh, colonial history, really, it does. Um, in 1650, among the first European settlers were Robert Baker and Dollar Davis. Prior to their arrival, the Mattachusett tribe, we lived in Pembroke, which was called Mattachusett, as I said before. English land grants grandfathered into the dominion of Plymouth Colony, provided settlers large tracts of land in Duxbury, situated Marshfield, of which the lands of Mattachusett were originally a part of. Okay. So if you want to look at some of the old uh, land grants, you can see how they were grandfathered into the dominion of Plymouth Colony. And in fact, again, go by the book Indian Deeds by Dr. Jeremy Bangs. An amazing book really shows you how um, colonists were able to have land taken. And then some of the laws that I'm going to in the Acts that I'm going to share with you a little later will also give you an example as to how um, Indian communities, we lost our land rights. Well, supposedly. Or what they used strategically for us to not have land rights. That's a better way of saying it. All right, next slide, please. Thanks. Patience Pomatuck. This is myself and my beautiful daughter who I named Asinipi. Um, Patience Wampatuck Fisher. Uh, I named her that name because Asinipi was one of our villages within the nation. Um, and I wanted her to never forget where she comes from if something was to happen to me. Um, she knows people will recognize that she's different. She comes from a different place and it engages questions. It engages 
Who are you? Where are you from? What's Asinipi? What does that mean? And she can educate them from being educated from her own tribe about where she's from, who she is, why the name. And so again, she's a walking testament of the continued existence of the Mattakisa people. Patience Pomatuck was my seventh great grandparent. This is an article that I found on her. She was known as the last Indian squaw living in Hingham, used to gather roots and herbs here and to sell them to the townspeople. In later days and early in this century, an eccentric colored woman called Black Patty used to visit Patience Garden and haunt the territory. I mean, you know, folks, they, they always use, anytime they think of native stuff, it's always used a lot of the time. Let me not say always. The majority, a lot of the times I have experienced personally that there's an associated with haunted homes, haunted areas, so on and so forth. You know, somebody's going to be telling, you know, your great, great grandkids that there was an Indian chief named Wampamequin Wampatuck, you know, and I heard he haunts this area. You know, it's, it's folktale. You know, um, however, the spirituality of our people is real, you know, and that, and that's also another reality, you know, and yeah, and we have to respect that. So that's that. Uh, next one, please. Asanipi Pomatuck, the legacy continues. That's my baby girl there. Um, that's us at Titicket. We're in the village. We go there. We share songs. I try to teach her as much as possible about who she is as a young Mattachusett woman. She's about six now. Um, and she could tell you more than me probably about being Mattachusett, to be honest with you, in the history. She's really, she really is the legacy. And so are all of our Mattachusett children who still get a chance to play on the land, the sacred land, who can tell the stories. When they all come together, they sit at the water's edge and they sing traditional ceremony songs. It's just really, it's a beautiful thing to be able to witness, um, especially with all of the resilient efforts and the efforts to wipe away and genocide the people of Mattachusa. It's just a beautiful thing to be able to see that today. Thank you, Brian. Next slide. Town of Hanson. I wish I could see your hands. How many people know about the town of Hanson? Very interesting place. Town of Hanson was incorporated in 1820. What if I told you that in order for the town of Hanson to have a full incorporation that they had to kill the last Indian standing. So in Hanson, it was first settled in about 1632 as the Western Parish of Pembroke. The town was officially incorporated in 1820 and was named for Maryland's newspaper publisher of the Federal Republican newspaper and U.S. Senator Alexander Conti Hanson. A lot of people don't know that. It's just a little bit of the colonial history. Next slide, Brian, please. Now, let's get into the fun stuff. The fun stuff, right? In 1820, there was an Indian drowning. So if you go on the vital records for Hanson, Massachusetts, this is what pulls up. Hanson, Mass, U.S. Gene Web Project. Okay? Documented the history of Hanson, Plymouth County, Massachusetts. African and Native American vital records. 18th to 19th century African-American Native, Native American vital records in Pembroke and Hanson. Now, why do I have this up? Well, a part of my lineage is I have a family line and it's called the Wood Line. And so let me show you what happened to the Wood people when the town became incorporated in 1820. Brian, next slide, please. This is exactly what happened. You see all those deaths, unfortunately drowned in Odom's Pond, unfortunately drowned in Odom's Pond. 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 You see all of those? Do you believe Indians who lived on the pond all just unfortunately drowned in little old Odom's Pond in 1820 during the time that the town was trying to incorporate? I'll let you ponder in that for a second. Yeah, I don't believe that either. Next slide, Brian. 1859, the Earl Report. So this is a report after the King Philip's War era, a guy by the name of John Milton Earl, he was commissioned by the governor to go out and check on the status of Indians. 
what Indians are still living, what Indians are poor, what Indians need help. Are there any chiefs left? Is there, do they know who they are? What's going on with these Indians? So John Milton Earl, he did a lot of our tribes a little favor by creating this little report called the Earl Report, where he listed only a few Mattachesic people in names, surnames that were left over. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were, if you came up against a history of attacks by white men since the time that they came over here from England or the Netherlands, and after a war just broke out and you were removed, your tribe was removed to Clark's Island where you know a whole lot of your family just died. And a white guy comes up to you and, and with a book and a pen and asks you, who are you? What's your name? Where are you from? You going to be comfortable telling him that? I don't think I would. So, yeah, it's nice that there's a little record called the 1859 Earl Report for a lot of tribes in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, there's probably only about 12 tribes in Massachusetts that are calling themselves tribes when in the 1859 Earl Report, there were like, I don't know, maybe a hundred tribes listed in that report. I could be wrong. I haven't looked at it in so many years. However, there's about 12 that call themselves tribes now who still struggle to actually feel free to exercise their self-determination to be tribes. Um, but thanks, John. You know, you did us a favor. The Earl Report was a nice report, 1859, listed surnames, and it helps families today to be able to um, claim their identity as an Indian, which, by the way, we're the only culture in the world who has to do that. But it also deters families from being able to say that they're Indian, right? Because they're not listed on the Earl Report, but they know their history, they have their genealogy, and their genealogy has names in that that don't add up to the Earl Report. And they're still Indians and they know which communities they come from. However, if it came down to a, a census and this was the say all and know all, and if you're not on this list, you're not an Indian, well, then you're screwed. So thanks, John Milton Earl as well. So, you know, some of these, th some of these things are great. Some of these things are used as weapons against Indian people to further um, commit this insidious trauma around uh, paper genocide. So thank you, Brian. Next, next, next slide, please. How many of you are familiar with the act of 1869, what was called the Indian Enfranchisement Act of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? I can't see your hands, but if you did raise your hand, thank you. If you didn't know, I'm here to share with you that in 1869, the Massachusetts legislature declared that all Indians and people of cover, color are heretofore known now and called Indians within the Commonwealth to be citizens of the Commonwealth. So that's such a beautiful thing, right? Like, oh, let's make the Indians citizens of our Commonwealth because we have such a great society. Um, and your society is savage, so we really want to help you to integrate into our society. So here's what happened with that. When that happened, all the rights, privileges, and immunities of Indian people were all subject in the duties and liabilities to citizenship. In this act, they provided that lands would revert to individuals and their heirs in fee simple opening the door to many sales of Indian land. In this act, they provided that lands would revert to ind individuals and their heirs in fee simple, opening the doors to sales to non-Indians. Let's read that again. In this act, they provided that lands would revert to individuals and their heirs in fee simple, opening the door to sales to non-Indians. Why is that an issue and why is that of significance? Well, a few slides ago, I told you that Josiah Swampatuck, who was the sachem of Mattachesett, did a phenomenal job in the early 1600s preserving 
and creating what was called a restrictive covenant so that there was no way possible that land could be estranged from Indian ownership. Well, a few years later, in 1869, the Commonwealth decided, well, we're going to create an act that does the exact opposite of what Josiah Swampatuck did. And now non-Indians can purchase Indian lands. So the question there is, is it valid when an Indian nation itself, who has a very separate government and a governing system, does not participate in the voting or the signing of an act such as the Indian Enfranchisement Act that would perpetually commit genocide against the existence of the people, which are tied to the land, who are one within the land, who are no different from their own land. That's the question. I leave it to you to critically think. Lands held in common could upon could upon application by any member of the tribe be petitioned among the proprietors. The act further ordered the provision of an aid to indigenous, indigenous Indians through the regular system of state almshouses rather than by individual appropriations and legislature. So I'll give you an example. If you lost your family in during the King Philip's War and after and so on and so forth, and you said, listen, I need help. I'm poor. I can no longer live in my village. My village, my community is desolate. They died. They were killed. They've been chased. They've been hunted. You know, all this stuff happened to your family and you're living by yourself, poor, like ro literally roaming from community to community, trying to find which community is even intact anymore. Um, and lives the way that you were always raised, they would they would pay you a couple cents or something like that, you know, a year, and they'd put you in what's called an almhouse, basically a poor house. And and they would uh, you know, they would take care of you, you know. But but you can't keep your airship to all of this land that you're entitled to. But yet, but we'll we'll pay you to stay in this poor house here. So that's what that was about. So anyways, the Indian Enfranchisement Act was an act that really created and changed the identity. Um, Brian, can you go back to the last slide again? No, no, right here, right here, right here. It's fine. I'm sorry. This act, again, changed the identity. The legislature declared that all Indians and people of color heretofore known and called Indians within the Commonwealth to be citizens of the Commonwealth. It changed it. It changed your status as an Indian to, that's when they started using that language in people of color. So now on your birth certificate, it no longer says you're an Indian. Now it might say you're a, pe you're a person of color. What color? Well, during that time, the only color that people would use or say was black if you weren't white or mulatto. It might even say mulatto. But it's still paper genocide. You're not, it doesn't say you're an Indian anymore. All right, thank you, Brian. Next slide. Annual Pembroke Parade, 1912. This is just a photo of some of the Mattachesett folks on the parade. They built their own parade. Um, it was just showing that, you know, people from the community were still participating in the parade. Um, there's continued evidence here, obviously of some of these Indians. Thank you. Next one. Uh, Mattachesett people here, you can see that they're participating in the Mashpee Powwow uh, in 1927. If I were to scroll in, but I don't need to, it says here that Nate Black of the Saga Tuckets. So others to take part will be Victor Perry to represent the Watupa Pond, um, Fall River Tribe, and Nate Black of the Saga Tuckets in Mattachusetts. So it shows that there's still Mattachusetts existence um, all the way up to the 1927 and participating with other Indians and that these other Indians do recognize these other Indian chiefs or sachems uh, from other communities. And this was in a Boston Globe um, article or something like that. I think it was Boston Globe. I have to look back. Um, next, please. 
MCIA, 1974. Anyone know what the MCIA is? If not, I'll tell you. MCIA stands for the Massachusetts Commission on Indian Affairs. Let me say that again. Massachusetts Commission on Indian Affairs. Can any of you all tell me, do they have a Massachusetts Commission on Italian Affairs? Do they have a Massachusetts Commission on Black Affairs? Do they have a Mass Commission on Irish Affairs? Or on Asian Affairs? No, but they do have one, though, on Massachusetts Commission on Indian Affairs. So I'll read a little bit. And I'll give you a little background. Michael Dukakis, at the time, he was a governor. He was the one who was the genius behind all of this, right? And said, oh, my God, we've got to... We, and I get, you know what? And I'll, and I'll give it to Michael, right? Michael thought that he was doing something that was going to be positive for the Indian people. And, you know, some of it is, you know? However, when he wrote the executive order in 1974 to establish a commission that was going to oversee the relationships, um, the treaty relationships and agreements, the legislative acts, the executive orders, and so on and so forth, showing that Indian nations had special status within the Commonwealth, he forgot to add all the other tribes. And so what he did was he added what's called Wampanoag and also added what's called Nipmuc. And those are the only, I want to say, and I could be wrong, I haven't looked at it in so long. However, I want to say that those are the only two tribes that at the time Dukakis um, wrote about in this executive order. And so because the executive order only states Wampanoag and Nipmuc, now all these other tribes who have rebanded themselves or revitalized their efforts, they don't get any recognition based off of that executive order because their tribe's names were not mentioned in the executive order. Okay? So that's what happened Um with that. And again, it's been an ongoing conflict with tribes who govern themselves and a state who has developed a commission to govern the affairs of Indian nations. Really, it's just a strategic way to say, you all are too powerful. You all have sovereignty. We cannot allow for you all to be that powerful and to have that much sovereignty while we share this jurisdiction, this territorial boundary. And so what they do is they put um, someone and people in those positions to strategically act as if they are supporting these tribes while actually doing more harm to the tribes. And so that's been an ongoing issue. Most of the tribes in the Commonwealth uh, do not support the current and ongoing commission that has been set up for us. Um, without our consent, our free prior informed consent. So that's just what that is. MCIA, thank you, Michael Dukakis, for your support. However, um, there's cultural sensitivities that are involved in the uh, in the development of that commission. Thank you, Brian. Next one. 2014 revitalization efforts. Woohoo! We did it. We did it, guys. We were super resilient. We made it. The Mattachese people made it. Um, people were banking and hoping and praying that we would not come back and know who we were based off of the sovereign rights, the international legal personality that we possess as a nation. Not as a people, but as a nation, as well as a people. Um, land that has been bought up by golf courses and uh, towns that have been incorporated and prisons that have been developed and conservation, uh, you know, conservation communities that they want to, they want to preserve the land. They're conservationists. They care about the land. You can't build here, but you also can't be an Indian trying to claim back any of this land either. So. The efforts around the revitalization of our tribal nation, they were amazing. Um, obviously, there's so much to uh, speak upon uh, in that regard. I don't think we have enough time to do that. It was a very challenging effort. 
um, I wasn't able to work an actual physical job, you know, for probably like seven or eight years straight. Um, every day I got up and I researched and I researched and I researched and I got so much backlash, not just from, you know, non-Indians. I got backlash from Indian communities, um, backlash from Indian organizations. It was just a lot. Um, and again, it's not necessarily the faults of Native nations and other Native people. It's just the unfortunate strategic mechanism of the art of war. You have five or six tribes who all typically almost share a very close in proximity jurisdiction. And three of those tribes get federally recognized and the other two don't. Comes a fight. One tribe is poor, their community is hurting. The other tribe is they've got money and they're doing very well. It creates a, a very strategic issue uh, within Indian communities, unfortunately, when it shouldn't be that way because we all come from the same place, have the same story. And we look alike. We all look like each other. <laughs> so um, next slide, please. Uh, this was actually... I think I took a photo of some genealogy that was done by a genealogist. I won't mention his name. Um, the genealogy report, folks, was not done with love at all. It was done completely in a way that I felt was a strategic way to continue paper genocide against um, against the Mattachesic people. Um, I think I had to threaten to sue or something like that, maybe. Um, and I'm just keeping it honest with you all. It was not, it wasn't, it was not a, uh, it wasn't an easy road to do all of this. Um, people had personal interests. They had family who had their own family's properties that were on tribal lands. They were afraid like, oh my God, the chief is going to, remove us. And I'm like, I would never do such a thing. I'm the coolest guy you'll ever meet. You know? Um, I was like, you think I'm going to, you're going to, I'm going to remove you. Like you guys removed us. I wouldn't, you know, it's not that kind of a, a thing. Um, either way, it resulted in many issues that came up with genealogy reports that we paid money to have completed the correct way. And they would not complete them um, correctly until, like I said, uh, we had to kind of push the hand of getting attorneys involved and things like that. Then we started to receive what we already knew because we researched it. However, we're not certified genealogists, so we can't actually do the reports, even though we know the information. So that was that. So I think I just put it in there um, just to also add to some of the resilient effort of, of the re revitalization effort. Please, next slide, Brian. Um, I think this was just a, a general court petition, job, and other Mattachusett Indians countering the petition of Patience Thomas and asking that their guardians be prohibited from selling. So right here, the reason why I put this in here was because this was a, a general petition um, to the general court that members of the Mattachusett tribe were... So even our lands, even up till today, have still um, been under attack with people trying to take land that we worked very, very hard to preserve in perpetuity. This shows you back then, the same thing was happening. All of these Indians here from Mattachusett, they were petitioning to the general court saying, hey, they're prohibiting from selling lands that they owned. They're asking the court, please intervene, please help. These people are taking our lands and we own these lands. We have deeds to these lands that are perpetuity deeds. So I just wanted to show you that this has been an ongoing conflict of, of folks trying to take land from the, from our tribe. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, where are the Mattachusets today? Mattachusets are everywhere. They're everywhere that you live. So if you live in Pembroke, they live there. If you live in Bridgewater, they're there. If you live in Raynham, they're there. You live in Norwell, they're there. They live in Duxbury, they're there. You live in Boston, they're there. You live in Rhode Island, they're there. Wherever you live, just assume that there are Mattachusett people 
everywhere where you are at. Um, today, we are a very small community. Um, we are not federally recognized um, because the federal recognition criteria through the CFR Part 83 is very, very, very um, culturally insensitive to some of the tribes here in the Northeastern region, considering the fact that most of our documentation was buried, it was stolen, it was burned, or whatever they did with it, it's missing. And so there is a part in the Petitioning Act that shows that a tribe had to have been a tribe together the whole way through without there ever being a crack in the governmental system, which obviously from this, um, this presentation, you yourself may have seen that there were acts that forbid Indians to be Indian. One of the acts that I don't think I mentioned to you all was the act of, um, what was it? I think it was uh, act of 1720, maybe? And that was called the Indian Imprisonment Act. Are, are any of you all familiar with the Indian Imprisonment Act by any chance? So the Indian Imprisonment Act was an act that stated that Indians could not be within 100 feet of the state house, the Boston Common, or else they could be imprisoned. That act was abolished only in 2004 or 2007 um, by Mayor Menino. So, yeah, there was acts that forbid tribes to be able to stay in, intact the way that the federal government is asking. However, today we are a beautiful people. We have community. Um, we're, we're relearning our language, our traditional ways. We gather together, we pray together, we laugh together, we cry together, we sing together, we dance together, um, we garden together, we fish together, we hunt together, um, you know, and, and we continue to be resilient together. And so we're just, we're a beautiful community. Come visit us sometime uh, throughout the, the beautiful seasons, mainly spring and summer. You'll find many Mattakeset hanging out over there on the Titicate Reserve, which is on Beach Street in Bridgewater. Um, we've put up several signs. A lot of our signs have been taken down. We put up more signs. Those have been taken down. Put up more signs. Those have been taken down. However, we're still resilient. We'll keep going um, because it's our land. And not only is it our land, that's our sacred home. That's where our ancestors are buried at. Um, a lot of you may or may not know, but in 1972, um, this by the gentleman by the name of Maurice Robbins, he was uh, from Harvard, and he actually did a uh, an excavation project, and he unearthed over like 80,000 artifacts or something like that of Mattachusett ancestors and different artifacts, spiritual objects, etc., um, at our home village of, of Titicate. And those um, those were put on display at the Peabody Museum. They were housed and archived in the Peabody Museum and also at the Robbins Museum. Today, you can still go to the Robbins Museum where they hold, um, you know, our sacred items and sacred objects there. So that's that. But Mattachies and people, we're doing okay. Um, we're not great, but we're doing okay. You know, and we thank God that we're alive and that you all today have come out to listen to this, um, this, this short lecture. So uh, I think there may not be any more left, Brian. I think that may be it. So thank you. And I will open this time up now for any questions. Thank you kindly. Thank you all for coming. Um, Dr. Fisher, it's just, uh, well, yeah, you're your words speak for themselves. Um, that was an amazing presentation. And uh, I have uh, so many, so many questions. And there are a lot of questions that have come in. Um, and so just uh, thank you for going through this with us. And uh, I can imagine the, the trauma that, you know, this uh, may uh, bring up for you. We really uh, appreciate that to provide us with the, this information and knowledge. Um, so, uh, wow. So uh, a couple 
questions. So if anyone has any questions, you can put in the Q&A. I know we do want to respect uh, Dr. Fisher's time, so we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, and so I'll just start going through from the top. And um, so, uh, Dr. Fisher, what's the relationship with the national national parks and the tribal land? Is there a relationship there between like the National Park Service or the Bureau of Land Management and, uh, and tribal land? Uh, thanks. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I kind of mentioned just a little bit where we actually have today our um, Titicket Reservation on Beach Street there in Bridgewater. It's known as Camp Titicket. Uh, folks go there, they fish, they camp. They try to make that into like a Boy Scout camp, which, you know, the tribe, we are super supportive of young men, especially and women to come on to uh, tribal lands and to learn, you know, how to survive on the land and so on and so forth. However, there are many places, many open wood spaces and conservation spaces where that kind of activity can take place. And so um, we did have some challenges with the Bridgewater Conservation Commission for, for a long time, for years, um, where they continued to fight us on uh, on jurisdiction, and now that we have a um, we have a conveyance, I'll, I'll say it like that. We have a conveyance, which is basically a letter um, and an agreement with the uh, with a few federal agencies. Um, we kind of have federal oversight and support a little bit um, to have access in consultation to our lands. And we have say as to what happens and what's being done on our lands. So to get back to the original question, we do look forward to better and more support. So if anyone has those kind of connections with like uh, Wampatuck State Park, which is actually, you know, um, named after our sachem, like, you know, we want access to those those places just for our people to be able to go to pray, to do ceremony and things like that, you know, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't have to ask for it, not in the 20th century anymore. There's too much information that's readily available to know that this land still does belong to uh, the tribal people. And, and also, there's this concept about land ownership that's completely different than what people even think when it comes to Indians and uh, the way that we look at land ownership. It's not the same way that the colonial construct of psychology looks at um, at Indian ownership for land ownership. So, I mean, in, land ownership. Okay. Um, in one of your slides, um, uh, quote, among the fields at Huck's Cove in a small tract formerly known as Patience's Garden, Patience yeah. Palmatic, last mm -hmm. Indian woman living in Hingham, uh, mm -hmm. used to quarter roots and herbs here. And sell to the townspeople. Question: Do we know where Patience Garden is, and if so, what's there now? And do we have any idea of what sorts of roots and herbs she was growing on that site and selling to the townspeople? Yeah, I think I think um, if you go there in Hingham, I think it's called Patience Cove still. So if you could find that area, you may be able to find where that site is. Um, I, I'd be I'll be quite honest with you. Uh, I, I think it's I think it's a beautiful question from whoever uh, posed that question because you're probably such a, an amazing person and a helpful person to think in that way. However, there are people who are very negative as well who would who would also like to go there to desecrate um, that sacred space. So, do I know where it's at? I do know where it's at. I brought my daughter there, so on and so forth. But I probably would not be the person to bring you there if you're not um, Madikusit. Do you know what sorts of um, things they may have been growing there? Yeah, she was big on um, on mullen. She was a mullen girl, so she uh, she used a lot of mullen to uh, to help people when they were sick. Uh, another question: What were the roles of women in leading the tribe? So over here, which is pretty interesting, so there's been a lot of debating between scholars, tribal scholars, non-tribal scholars, as to whether or not um, our societies were matriarchal or patriarchal societies. Um, obviously, you can hear that there's a lot of patriarchy uh, in the communities because of the sachems. However, 
there's also sachems um, who were women um, who like Namam Pom, she had a few names, Weedamo, Namam Pom. Um, and there was another name that she had. It's not ringing a bell. However, um, they had major roles, clan mothers, like even to this day, like even sachems, like we don't do nothing without our women. They tell us what to do and we just do it. We're just the face. We're the target, you know? So, um, yeah, we're just the target, but, uh, yeah, you know, our women are very well respected in Indian country in general. Um, but our Indian women had a, a major role, you know, and, you know, like I could read a book and tell you what their role was, but I'm not, you know, and I wasn't there in the 1600s. So I really can't tell you what exactly the role was. I can only tell you from an eyewitness account, probably from a colonist perspective of what the role was. But if you ask an Indian woman who was living in the 1600s, who would still be alive today, which obviously they're not they may tell you a whole completely perspective. And so I'd like not to really muddy the water and give you some kind of false perspective, but I can tell you what the role is today. We respect our women within our tribal communities. We respect our elder women and also our clan mothers are very important to the continued sustainable efforts of our tribal governance. Hmm. Is there a native name that would be more appropriate for the Indian Head River or the Indian Head Pond? Yeah, absolutely. You name it after the people, the Mattachusett River, you know, um, maybe come up with another name, you know, for one of the ponds, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that question. But like Indian Head River, like, what does that mean? Like, um, oh, chop the Indian's head off and throw his head in the river. So that's not like a make-believe thing. They actually did that to Philip, right? Like to Medicom, like they cut his head off and put it on a pike for like, what was it? A hundred years or something crazy like that. And yeah, that's a real thing. So to call it Indian Head River, I can only imagine where that name came from. So yeah, there's definitely other names that are traditional that they can be renamed. And I will say this, I got to give a huge shout out to the folks in Pembroke because um, there's the wildlife. Uh, help me with this, Brian. Is, is it called wildlife or trustees? Um, Wildlands Trust. Yeah, the Wildlands Trust. I love those folks. You know why? I gave a lecture years ago in Pembroke and you know what? They were real allies. They stepped up to the plate. They've been helping like crazy, you know, and we actually are working on renaming some of the trails, renaming some of the rivers, you know, putting up signs, getting things really more culturally appropriate. Um, so shout outs to the Wildland Trust folks uh, tonight, too, um, for your continued effort to uh, to support the existence of the Mattachese people. Thank you so much. What type of professional development would you suggest state legislatures have when taking an oath that has history covered up the relationship with the tribes? Say that one more time, please. What type of professional development would you suggest state legislatures have when taking an oath that has history covered up the relationship with tribes? So, Brian, the way that I'll answer that is to say this. Tribes are like patients in a clinic. You cannot treat every patient the same because it just doesn't work that way. Patient-centered, individualized care. Tribal-centered, individualized care. Treat the tribes as individual communities, not as the same as another tribe. Consultation, consultation, consultation. Free, prior, and informed consent. Free, prior, and informed consent. Consultation, consultation, consultation. Reach out to the tribes. Ask them what they want. And don't assume that externally interfering within their right to self-determination is okay. That's the way that I would say that. That's how I'd answer it. I'm going to combine. We've got several questions here about what can non-Indians do to help assist the Mattachesit or how can people get involved to support the Mattachesit culture? 
I would I would show up when there's a call to show up. Um, if the Maticus of people need support, you know, show up. You know, keep your ear to the ground. Also share with your friends and family about the tribes and their struggles and also about their successes too, you know. Um, just be an honest ally, you know, and also don't overreach. Just do what you can in the capacity in which you can that's comfortable for you. But also before you come to the community to try to help, please, 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 I urge you that you help yourself first. And when I say that, I mean to say that if you have not had your own healing in regards to your own, um, and this is not for everyone, so please excuse me, but your own oppressive um, behavioral patterns that are being suppressed within yourself, then please don't bring that to those communities who are trying to heal at this time. Bring your honest self. If your honest self is unhealthy, be honest. You know, have talking circle. Request to have talking circle with those communities and say, hey, look, I really want to help. However, here's my issues. But don't burden the tribes. They already got enough issues. <laughs> please, please don't do that. Um, but seriously, you know, reach out to the tribes if they need your help. Maybe they need something written. Maybe they need you to make a few phone calls. Maybe they need you to go to the state house and lobby for them. You know, maybe they need some support, raising money for a community event or something that a, a young person in the tribe or an elder needs, you know, something like that. If you can do that, if you can spare a little extra, go out of your way and do it. You know, and that's, that's to anything, not just to tribes, but to any good cause that you could give to, you know. A few more. Is there, and thank you, Dr. Fisher, for answering these questions. No, no problem. Is there a monument or space on Clark's Island documenting the incarceration of the Mattachusetts? You know, there's not, not one. I roamed that place a few times, you know. There's no monument as such. There's only, a, I'll tell you what there is a monument of, which is really interesting. So everyone goes to Plymouth and goes and looks at this like little rock. They call it Plymouth the Rock. But if you go to Duxbury to Clark's Island, you'll actually see the real rock. It's called the Pulpit Rock, and it's huge. That was actually the rock you saw my hand and my cousin's hand on. That is the actual real Plymouth Rock. Now, if you study the navigational directions and the patterns as to where and how the English came in on their boats, you see that rock. You don't see that little tiny baby rock in Plymouth. You actually see that rock. So that's actually a navigational pattern coming from Europe, it actually goes that direction. So that's an interesting piece. It's the only monument that's there. And it says on the back, it says on the back of the rock, it's carved. It actually says on this Sabbath day, we rested here, 1621. It says something like something, something from 1621. It's pretty interesting, but um, nope, there's no monument. There should be more monuments. There should be statues, not of just old chiefs, put up the new leaders. Put up statues of the young people doing great things. Like, you know, we've got to move past like this old past history and and really, you know, cultural preservation is not just remote, it's also recent. So I think we have to work on that. Um let's see. Oh, Dr. Fisher, I've got several folks interested in um maybe a way to get in contact with you. Um, yeah, that's fine. So I, if you all want to get in contact with me, uh, you can you can email me at matakesittribalgov at gmail.com. Or you can also go and check out the website. I think it's like matakesit.com. Um, we try to update some things there. Brian, I see that you've added uh, my information there in the chat. Yeah, send an email. Um, it'll either go to me or our tribal secretary. Um, yeah, please, please try to get in contact. Um, I'm not always this, I'm not like bitter like this all the time, but you know, it's like, it's a little traumatic, you know, when we have to share the stories and also, it's also not always about covering up things for other people's comfortability. It's about just simply being honest about the experience. And that is how we educate the best. 
And so that's what I'm doing this evening is I'm trying to educate the best because I care about your education. I want you all to be educated the correct way and to know what happened, what's going on, how we feel about things. So no one can tell you anything different. You can't go read something different in a book. You heard it from the horse's mouth. And um, we'll probably just keep it at, at one or two more. Um, sure. What is the preferred term when referring to indigenous peoples? Um, again, when it comes to uh, indigenous peoples, you consult with the actual people and you ask them, what do you prefer to be called? Some people may want to be called this or that, you know, and I'll give you a good example, right? Like you can go to like what people used to refer to as the Navajo people. You know, some of the Navajo people, they tell you, we don't want to be called Navajo. It's a Spanish word. We don't like it. We want to be called the Diné, which means the people, you know? So again, every tribal community is going to be different. But I would suggest and encourage for you to ask them first, what do you prefer to be called? It's very simple. I think we know that now with when it comes to pronouns, right? Like we now have been educated to ask, what are your pronouns? What do you prefer to be, you know, um, seen as? So it's the same thing. There are so many comments dr fisher folks saying thank you thank you for your time interested in getting uh, providing support however they can so um just be ready for an influx of of contacts um to you um and and just so everyone knows i did put um dr fisher's email in the chat there so um with that I'm, i apologize we didn't get to every question but um if anyone you know, if you want brian you can you can uh I'm still very curious um, on questions um, because questions are, they probe critical thoughts. And so um, for everyone that did pose a question, I will with Brian, maybe at a later date, we can kind of go through some of the questions. We can shuffle through some of the questions that we find that are most appropriate. And uh, maybe I can send a few answers back to those questions and Brian, he can go ahead and post them somewhere. Um, because again, I, I always think that questions probe critical thought. That's always been my concept. Um, and so thank you all for having me, um, allowing me to come into your space. Brian, thank you for allowing me to come into your space here on the Zoom and to share a little story about a little tribe that had a whole lot of heart. So thank you so much. And I appreciate you. Uh, the it's the pleasure is all on this side of the table. Thank you so much, Dr. Fisher, for um, uh, being with us tonight and providing just a, a brief snapshot into um, something that is just so clearly um, overlooked. So we really yeah. appreciate and, your time. And again, kudos to you as well, Brian. You did a great job, uh, you know, keeping me abreast on everything that was happening um, during this uh, up up till this to this minute. Uh, and Doug, thank you as well. So thank you all. Have a good night. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fisher. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Peace, Kanash. Um, and thanks all of you for, for being here. We're going to end the session. Um, please join us next week, Wednesday, February 1st, um, to talk about PFAS in our waters. Um, Hanover Water Superintendent, Norwell Water Supply, and a Norwell Water Commissioner, as well as a toxicologist with Mass Department of Environmental Protection, uh, is going to talk about this thing that is now in our waters. Uh, and so it's going to be a, a very open discussion among a panel about uh, what's going on there and what to do with these so-called forever chemicals. So, Oh, Brian, um, a quick, really quick question. I apologize yeah. to cut you off. I just thought about it, too. One thing that might be supportive is that we have um, we have a beautiful river called the Cotiticate River that runs right through our reservation lands. Uh, if any folks are water experts, um, I would love to know what is going on uh, even in our waters as well. How do we maintain our waters to keep it, you know, super clean? Um, we have a natural um, spring also that runs through our reservation lands. And so, yeah, we would love the community support on helping us to make sure that we have some of the top quality waters and not just for us, but there's going to come a time 
where people are going to need access to clean water. And so I think it's really all of our job to, if we can find a natural resource like we have on our own lands, um, you know, you all should should be able to be welcomed to that land as well to be able to have access to fresh and clean water. So, uh, you know, it takes a village to, to, to do that. And so we welcome folks who are experts in uh, water restoration to come onto our lands and to help us and support our water. Our water is our life and, and, it, and it's really, it mirrors who we are as Manakisa people. So thank you and sorry, Brian. No, that's a, that's a great uh, that's a great point, and I'll definitely make sure to provide you with with folks who are knowledgeable, especially in that that particular watershed. Uh, we we work very hard to preserve and protect the waters uh, the the waters within the watershed of the North and South Rivers, including the the Pembroke Ponds, uh, right. and 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 preserving the historic herring runs that have been migrating for for tens of thousands of years. So, um, well, thank you all. That's awesome. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so once again, uh, special thank you to Dr. Fisher for being with us tonight. And um, thanks so much, Doug, uh, with Mass Audubon. And a, a brief shout out to our sponsors of Clean Harbors, Clear Water Recovery, and the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Duxbury, Hanover, Marshfield, Norwell, Pembroke, Plymouth, and Situate. Once again, thank you so much for your support. And with that, really appreciate your time, Dr. Fisher. I hope you have a great night. Thanks for talking with us thank tonight. You. Thank you, Brian. Bye-bye. All right. Have a good night, everybody.